You may have heard it said, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. Well, there are those who fly a little further with that fun fact. A hummingbird researcher and her avian loving husband escape all that is worrying the world by taking exotic worldwide work vacations. But often at the end of a long work day, they also recognize the rewards they receive when they just retreat right here at home. Even though I'm out there running around banding birds, you know, all day long, I come home and sit on my porch and just watch them and enjoy them. It's like the cobbler's kids don't have shoes while my hummingbirds don't have bands. A few of them do. But... <laughs> because I don't have time. By the time I get home, it's like, oh, let's just watch them. Let's leave them be. Need, so, to, need to breathe every now and then. Yeah, right? and just enjoy them. We're kind of building a habitat, a sanctuary for the wildlife since it's disappearing so fast. And so we plant native plants and we have water features everywhere and don't do a lot of cutting of the trees and trimming. We do leave uh, branches for hummingbirds to sit on. You'll see dead branches, but hummingbirds love that. So um, we just practice what we preach. Well, we got into it as a hobby first. Yeah. I mean, me first, honestly. Next thing I know, She's going in full steam. Yeah. yeah, I can't do anything halfway. No. I have no. to do it all the way. So once I latched <laughs> onto it, I really latched onto yep. it. And I decided I wanted to uh, bird band. And uh, so then I set out to do that. And that's where it all began, really. We don't really know exactly how many we have. We can estimate. During migration, they say the number that you can count at one time that you see, you multiply it by six. So we were counting 15 last night, so could you multiply that by six and have those birds? Um, earlier in August, a few years back, I put that to the test, and it was within a few birds, really. Mm -hmm. I just found out this week that they have nano tags that we're going to be able to put on these birds beginning next season. They were actually developed for monarchs and they were putting them on monarchs and now we can start putting them on hummingbirds. Yeah, I've been waiting on that for a while. Yeah, we have been waiting on it for a while and it's going to change what we know about hummingbird migration. We know it's going to. You have to have a modus tower so they, the, they, the tag talks to the tower. They're solar. You glue them on so they're only going to last about 60 to 90 days. But we're going to get a lot of information in that time. There's 343 species of hummingbirds, though, in the Americas, because they're only found in yeah. the Americas. It's only a Western Hemisphere phenomenon. Well, in Cuba, there's it's only two. Only two, yeah. Just the Cuban emerald and the bee hummingbird. So I'm on a quest to see as many hummingbird species as I can. So we went to Cuba, because you have to go to Cuba to see the bee hummingbird which is the smallest bird on Earth. It's two inches. And it's only there. It's an endemic of Cuba, and you have to go. Just the experience of being on the, on the island was, yeah. it was probably, I mean, the birds were nice, but just knowing that, you know, not everybody gets to do this. We were going and birding and then turning our information over to them to use for ecotourism mm. and science and that. So. That's kind of how we were able to go. It was a special permit um, that allowed us to go. Yeah. And we saw the bee hummingbird, and I ugly cried when I saw it. You could just walk right up to them, practically. And then that little bee hummingbird was like right here. We could have touched noses, and it was feeding. It could have cared less about me. It was all about the sugar water. And, and that's when I... And yeah, it had genuinely Tears running down my face. But what she may not have seen was that our leader, who was a uh, Cuban and was a um, you know, researcher, professor, he was sitting behind us. And I just kind of glanced back at Alejandro, and his eyes were moist because he, he knew how much yeah. it meant to her. He would kid her because we knew we were going to get a chance to see the bee hummingbird. And he goes, well, we might get a chance with a scope way far away, knowing full well we were going to be right on top of them. Yeah. <laughs> but when the moment came, it, it uh, touched everybody, and particularly, well, not only Cindy, of course, but Alejandro, I think, was quite touched by her reaction. Mm -hmm. 
the second thing that was kind of neat, very neat, was taking a two-hour boat ride on a rowboat out into a lake where we probably Lagoon. saw a thousand flamingos. All just standing, eating. Then they would lift and fly to another area, and that was that was pretty. Fly stunning. over us, two thousand flamingos flying over the top of us. Then, eighty days later, we uh, went to Ecuador. It was a hummingbird-centric trip, meaning that we went to a lot of feeding stations and a lot of places where hummingbirds would gather. And so, because of that, we saw sixty different species of hummingbirds in the eleven days that we were there. Each day was like a new adventure, so you know you knew you were going to see something different. So in 80 days, we saw the smallest hummingbird in the world, the bee hummingbird, and the biggest hummingbird in the world in Ecuador called the giant hummingbird. We're going back to Ecuador <laughs> in October of 2024. Another part. Another part. part, the southern part. So we'll see hummingbirds there that we were not in the northern part where we were. In a matter of 15 or 20 miles, you would see one species and then not in those miles. And that's how yeah. localized some of these species are. They tend not to do the north-south migration as much as we really migrate much at all. It's more, if they migrate at all, it's more altitudinal, Altitude. but even then they don't go too far. Cause, no. But you'll have a difference. We'll be up 12,000 feet, see one hummingbird. If you go down 4,000 feet, see another group, 4,000 feet down to two. further, you know, you're, you're getting different ones. East slope, west slope of the Andes, totally different species altogether. It's 130 some. In oh yeah, 132 in Ecuador, in Ecuador itself. Every time we go to one place, it just gets us inspired to we go have a somewhere list else. Go somewhere <laughs> else. Costa Rica in February. We want to go to Madagascar because that, like Cuba, is an island with birds that are only endemic to Madagascar. So yeah, our list keeps growing and changing. It's something that we can do together and grow old doing together. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot of thought process or planning. You just go, well, well, let's go to Duck River today, or let's go to Cross Creeks, or let's go to tomorrow to Florida. Okay. Yeah, tomorrow we're going to Florida <laughs> to find a rare golf. So, on our way to Rockport. So, yeah, it's fun to be able to do it together. After returning from their excursions, Cindy Routledge wrote a grant in order to send money for more research in Cuba. She says 66% of our migratory birds pass through Cuba, and it's important that they continue to do research so the birds have a place to go and it doesn't get overdeveloped. Tennessee's Wild Side has been a presentation of the Jackson Foundation in association with Rockwater TV.